Thank you everyone for joining the GLTF webinar for October 2021. Today's session will take approximately two hours. First, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded. At the end of the event, a survey will pop up. To help us improve future events, we would appreciate your feedback. Please watch for an email with further information and a link to the recorded presentations. The agenda for today features the chair of the GLTF Working Group, Brent Scannell, leading the way with an update in his GLTF Fast Forward, followed by Max Limper from DGG, presenting Scaling Up 3D Asset Creation for e-commerce. Daniel Frith from IKEA will talk to us about GLTF and 3D standardization in IKEA. Peter Kovacs from the Institute of Computer Science and Control will demonstrate using GLTF to build a virtual factory in a highly interdisciplinary environment. And Tam Balina from Esri will present a case study on GLTF and geospatial. Following Tam's presentation, we will have an open Q&A session with a panel of GLTF experts. And now I'd like to introduce our first presenter of the day, the chair of the GLTF Working Group, Brent Scannell from Autodesk. Brent will give us an update on all things GLTF and his GLTF Fast Forward. Brent, if you'd like to take the screen. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jeff, and, and thanks to Coronas for having me and hosting me today. Um, so today I'm going to give you guys a bit of a fast forward on what GLTF is all about, uh, get you all caught up so that uh, I can set the stage for our uh, amazing line of panelists who are going to give you a more in-depth uh, set of case studies and, and explore GLTF and use cases. Um, so as Jeff mentioned, I am the 3D Formats Working Group Chair. 3D Formats is the working group within Kronos that handles standards such as GLTF. Uh, that's my part-time job, my day job. I'm actually a product manager at Autodesk and I deal with all things AR, MR, VR. Uh, that's really my passion. That's what I, I spend most of my time doing. Um, but I love to participate in events like this with GLTF. Uh, a quick intro to the 3D Formats Working Group. Um, we handle things like the Collada format, which you may have remembered from you know, early 2000s. We handle the KTX uh, image container format, uh, which is kind of an image container specific for loading onto GPU APIs. And more recently, uh, we handle the GLTF file format. Um, GLTF was born as an idea in 2012, hit V1 in 2015, V2 2017, and I'll give you guys all the uh, get you guys all caught up uh, throughout this presentation. Again, just introducing you guys to the GLTF ecosystem. There's a whole array of folks, and you'll get to meet some of them on today's, on today's uh, webinar that make up the, the 3D formats and GLTF ecosystem. You know, merging from create to uh, repositories to 3D models. We have some people from, from TurboSquid on the call today, uh, Sketchfab, CG Trader. We have game engines who can load all this content in. We have web engines who can display this on mobile devices through the web without a native app. Uh, apps and engines, VR engines. Uh, it's a really a full circle and a, and a thriving community that keeps on growing. Like this slide, every logo keeps getting smaller as we have more folks to it. It's a really amazing thing to be part of. Um, to give you guys a bit of an update about how the 3D formats group works, um, there are member companies and sponsored individuals, so most of them are on the call today, um, that we work in the 3D formats working group. Uh, I'm the chair of that group, but we also have some other officers. Uh, we have uh, representatives from Facebook, from Target. Uh, we also have specification editors. A lot of the work actually happens in, within these task subgroups that maybe you guys in the public don't know so much about. So we have two active subgroups right, or, or task subgroups right now. One of them that handles all the physically based rendering stuff, chaired by Ed Mackey. Uh, that's where you see things like all the PBR extensions that have come out recently. Uh, that's the group that's been working on that. And we have a somewhat newly formed group that's handling GLTF tooling. So trying to figure out how we can have a bigger presence within the tooling ecosystem, make sure IO libraries are up to date with the newest extensions, um, making sure projects are discoverable, making sure we can have a little bit of ownership of some projects and make sure that it's obvious for the ecosystem which ones to go pick and which ones are, are up to date and supported in that nature. Um, as inputs to our, our group, we have uh, the adopters of our formats who give us uh, you know, implementation samples, uh, help us uh, understand what's needed or what's missing, finding, helping us find bugs, giving us input to our roadmap. Um, developers themselves who use the APIs, use the specs, um, you know, again, tell us what's wrong or what's, what's missing. We try to participate in much mechanic conferences and press events such as this to strengthen the ecosystem, raise awareness, get additional inputs, grow our ecosystem. 
Uh, we also liaison with other standards bodies. Um, so, uh, you know, the list could go on, but um, things like the MPEG working group at times, uh, IEC and GTC and ISO, um, Web3D, you know, we interface and, and try to interface with standard, other standards bodies to not create kind of competition or too much overlap when possible. And we set up uh, official liaison relationships as well as uh, industry and ecosystem advisors. And these are kind of a, a tighter group of folks that we, we get um, a more intimate relationship with, that we share IP with. And we'll go into how to participate in any of these kind of uh, levels of engagement uh, as we go on. Um, again, a little bit how we work. The 3D formats working group is where most of the decisions happen. This is where we develop strategy and roadmap. This is where we you know, create our, our outreach strategy and have these discussions. And then the task star groups is where a lot of these, uh, the actual work and specification development happens. Um, a little bit about the GLTF evolution. So again, 2015, it was um, the V1 was released. It was primarily for WebGL, uh, basically a mirror of the WebGL API into a file format. Things got really interesting with the GLTF 2.0 file format. Um, this is when we brought the metallic roughness PBR model in. Um, this is where materials started to get really high fidelity, really got interesting. Uh, 2018, we brought Draco mesh compression in um, to make the transmission size uh, much smaller and really accomplish some of the core mission values of GLTF to make an efficient runtime format. Um, we'll see a little bit more. And, you know, in, in the last year, we developed uh, a number of PBR material extensions. So things like transmission, clear coat, and sheen. I'll go into those in more detail later. Uh, we also started working with a 3D commerce working group, which is another group within Kronos um, that deals specifically around the challenges and in the retail context, e commerce context, and how standards can help um, make the whole ecosystem stronger and better and faster. And uh, it's no surprise that a lot of those folks work very closely with the GLTI file format. And for the last you know, 18 months or two years, we've worked very closely with the 3D Commerce Working Group to satisfy their development needs as well. Uh, in 2021, most recently, uh, even more PBR extensions, again, coming primarily from the 3D Commerce Group. Um, we developed the KTX2 uh, universal texture format, which again, uh, contributes to our mission of making that super efficient runtime file format that is GLTF. We started adding support to metadata, uh, and most recently, as of about a month ago, we started preparing for an ISO uh, international standard submission. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll also go into a little bit of what we're thinking about for future roadmap, but we can we can save that for later. So uh, again, the first wave of PBR started happening around December 2020. We added clear coat, transmission, and sheen. So clear coat, as you might imagine, as that you know, uh, like imagine paint on a car when you have that clear coat, it has that extra layer of shine. Um, gives us some depth. Uh, really the best way to experience this is using that sample viewer that we will publish, uh, the link at the bottom of this page. Uh, you can turn that thing on and off and really see the effect. Um, transmission is another one that we released in 2020. Uh, it enables things like plastics and glass uh, and it was really kind of a game changer compared to how things would have been done in GLTF before using alpha coverage purely, which is not kind of a real a, uh, physically based or physically accurate way to simulate things like glass. Uh, you don't have any refractor properties, anything like that. So transmission is really a game changer for anything that has any level of, of transparency. Um, and Sheen was another big one that came out of the 3D Commerce Working Group. You know, we have a lot of furniture manufacturers and textile manufacturers and retailers in that group, and they demanded things that would enable cloth and fabric to seem real uh, within a 3D web rendered context. So Sheen was developed uh, and released in 2020, uh, December 2020. Uh, again, best way to experience these is using the GLTS sample viewer, link below. And we also have that press release that goes into more detail and where to find more information about all those topics. The second wave of PBR followed about six months later in July 2021. Um, this is where we kind of expanded a little bit more in the transmission uh, area. So we added the index of refraction to transparent materials. We also added the depth properties and attenuation properties and thickness for non ray tracing engines. So this is really kind of taking transmission to the next level and enabling effects like I've shown on this olive dish example, where you have refraction and, and you know kind of colorized and stylized specular refractions via this material specular extension. Um, you know, it really, really goes that extra level to um, make these models physically and, and almost photorealistic, if you will, uh, representations of that, that content. So really, really awesome work coming from the PBR group. And um, you know that was all released about six, uh, in, well, about six months ago now, not quite, but July 2021. Again, best way to go experience these is through our sample viewer release uh, and visit our press release that goes into um, more details with that. Um, in April 2021, so just backing up a little bit more in time, we also worked and released the KTX2 image container. 
So basically what this does is it adds support for the basis universal super compressed uh, GPU textures. Uh, that's a mouthful. Um, what it does is makes um, your PNG and JPEG files ultra small and super compressed, but in a way that's can be transcoded to the GPU on the fly. So no real loss in performance to decompress it, um, but really compresses that transmission size down. We'll go into a few examples. Um, again, this is enabled in the GLTF file format via the texture basis U extension that was also released at the same time. Um, best way again to see that is through the uh, press release where we have some examples, but I will go into a little bit about that because I think it's important to do so. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, you're taking your PNG and JPEG based assets, you uh, encode and super compress them with the binomial alg algorithm. Um, these fall into the KTX image container, which is what makes it uh, compatible with GLTF and portable and contained within GLTF. And then these get uh, transcoded on the fly to any number of GPU uh, APIs. Um, a good practical example, this is how you really get communicated what, what's going on there. The initial uh, model that we worked with was uh, a 12.8 megabyte uh, transmission size consuming about uh, 96 megabytes of memory. Uh, using one pattern or one algorithm of compression, we got that down to 10.4 and 21.4 respectively, file size and, and memory size. And then using the most aggressive compression, uh, got that down to 4.6 megs transmission and 15.7 uh, memory footprint. And you can see from the, from the photos here, even if they're not super zoomed in, there's no appreciable loss of quality. I mean, there are some artifacts that start to show, especially as you get more aggressive. And there are varying degrees of how you can compress this, but you know, uh, taking a, a file size and reducing it by you know more than half the transmission size and, and even more than that for memory footprint, you know, I don't need to explain the benefits of that. So I, I hope it speaks for itself. But again, I encourage you guys to go to the press release and really ex you know go explore some of the more examples in detail. It's, it's a really powerful piece of technology that we've included in GLTF now. Um, again, jumping over to 3D Commerce collaboration, uh, we released two extensions, uh, one of them in November 2020. Uh, this one supports material variants. So the good example is these shoes, which have a lot of common parts. The sole is always the same. The shoelaces are probably the same model, the base shoe, and maybe the same geometry most of the time, but they might have you know, material differences. So different, different lace colors, different lace materials, different shoe patterns, or even sole materials. The material variance extension enables you to pack all those variants into a single GOB file or GLTF file, if you will, and then use um, this extension to switch between them in a viewer so that you don't need to maintain multiple copies of the same asset, copy the same geometry over and over again, when all you really want to do is switch materials. So that was released in 2020, specifically uh, in conjunction with 3D Commerce. And the most recent one is a provisional release of a metadata extension or uh, improvement to the existing metadata system in GLTF uh, that was provisionally released in 2021. Um, that's kind of going through a more formal release cycle now as we review you know, feedback from the, from the industry and making sure it coordinates with other um, standards we want to leverage. But again, it's adding the necessary metadata components and hooks so that retailers can, can do what they need to do with the data on their web platforms, on their retail platforms, uh, all, in, all inside of a single GLTF file without having to manage a network of other dependencies. Um, once again, the best place to get more info is through the press release link, and we'll share all these things out later. Um, let's move it along. The most recent piece of development for GLTF, again, going super fast into the future now. This is current as of about one month ago. Um, so Kronos was recognized as a GTC1 submitter in May 2021. And why that's important is we're preparing GLTF to become an ISO international standard and transpose it via the ISO IEC GTC1 process. Uh, again, that's a mouthful, but again, our goal here is to uh, prepare GLTF for an international standard. Um, we're trying to get the wheels in motion to make that a reality probably within the next 12 months. Again, it's a long, complicated process that I won't, I'll spare you all the details. Um, but the important milestone for GLTF was last month we released uh, a GLTF 2.0.0 specification. Um, what that means for you, the community, um, no technical changes. You know, GLTF 2.0 is still GLTF 2.0, but this new uh, minor version um, basically had a complete overhaul of the specification language and formatting and essentially augmented the quality of that document to be consistent with what an international standard requires. So I, I think you'll, you'll be delighted that, um, you know, the specification is much, much easier to follow. Uh, a lot of the references are clearly labeled when they're normative or not. Um, you know, it's, it's consistent with what you'd expect of an international standard. And that was kind of our first milestone, as I mentioned, to getting GLTF recognized as an international standard. Uh, I'll say it again, <laughs> the best place to get more information, the blog post mentioned below. 
So uh, probably the most juiciest topic, you know, what's next? Um, this is a super, super interesting topic and one that we in the working group have been discussing for a long time. You know, we're coming off this wave of retail fueled and e-commerce fueled uh, PBR extensions and other extensions uh, for that. And now we're in this kind of open, open world, if you will, about what's next. Uh, we have monthly meetings to discuss um, what is actually going to be the next most you know, important thing. Um, things like the metaverse come, come up a lot. How might we standardize things like avatars? How might we enable uh, better anchoring systems for assets for placement in furniture and rooms or in general in AR? Um, these are a few of the topics that we're kind of considering. Uh, again, it's a super, super uh, wide open ocean right now. And we're looking to you, know, you guys, the community, to help give us some input. You know, we have, like I mentioned, uh, a network of advisors that we have a, a close relationship with, especially around IP sharing. But in a more general sense, you know, we want to hear from the community. What's important for you? What are the problems that are not really solved by a standard or a format today that perhaps GLT GLTF can help with? Uh, we really, really want to get your input. Uh, we really want to make sure that, um, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we are taking a good pulse from time to time with the ecosystem, with the community to make sure that we're, we're remaining relevant. Um, so again, this list is not arbitrary. It's, it's, it's thought out and it's things that are being discussed, but where the real challenge is is prioritizing these things and, and grouping them together to develop them to make sense in an impactful way. And, and again, the ecosystem and you, the community are kind of crucial to that, um, making a, a relevant roadmap. We, we wanna hear from you. So I'm gonna leave you guys with a couple of ways to get involved with us, with the, with the 3D Commerce, uh, sorry, 3D Formats Working Group. Uh, we have a GLTF Slack instance, a dedicated instance right now. If you follow that short link, uh, you can get right in there. There's no barrier to entry. You can join uh, freely and discuss with uh, members and other community uh, participants alike. Uh, we also have a public GitHub. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise to most of you where you can um, log issues, have discussions there. Um, most of those are, are kind of track day issues, I would say. Uh, our website always has the latest and greatest. Whenever we have a piece of development, a piece of news, it's posted to our website. That's a great place to find out about the next webinar, for example, or other developments that are being released. The website is always the best place to go. Um, and also, if you're interested about membership or any other questions about kind of a more engaged relationship with the 3D, uh, with the 3D formats working group, please feel free to send an email to, uh, that's, that's my current email there. Uh, that'll go directly to me. Uh, I share it with the other officers in the group uh, when we have you know, prospective members or other interesting topics that um, you know, are maybe not appropriate for Slack or something like that, please always feel free to send me an email. I, I read those and I check those and I respond to those um, quickly and daily. So um, that's it for me. I don't know if we have time for questions or if we're gonna wait till the end. Uh, I suspect we're running close on time, Jeff. Um, yes, uh, we're gonna wait for the, for the end to answer perfect, these perfect. questions as we go forward. And thank you for the working group updates. Yeah, Next thank up. you. I mean, that, that was a fast forward as promised, and it was very, very fast. So I apologize for, for <laughs> a lot through. to cover. For sure. <laughs> a lot to cover. But again, I'd love to keep the conversation going. Please feel free to engage with us or me directly, and uh, we'll definitely keep this conversation going. Wonderful. Next up is Max Limper from DGG, who will present scaling up 3D asset creation for e-commerce. Max, go ahead and take the screen. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And Thanks, Brent, for the great introduction about the 3D formats work. So, um, as said, GLTF has been seeing uh, a lot of adoption, luckily, in the e-commerce world, and this has been super exciting. And it has been so exciting that actually a lot of retailers and uh, tech companies got together and founded the Kronos uh, working group called the 3D Commerce Group. So, I'm going to look at the whole GLTF topic a bit more from that angle within this presentation. And um, very quick introduction about myself. I'm co-chair of the 3D Commerce Asset Creation Task Subgroup, where we uh, discuss about like asset creation workflows for specifically 3D Commerce, but those could also be applied in other areas. And I originally have a tech background, um, worked on like automating 3D data optimization, and at some point uh, founded a tech startup called DGG, where we have software called Rapid Compact that lets you automate uh, 3D data optimization. So um, without further ado, let's have a look uh, at some examples where you can already see right now, today, um, AR applications in e-commerce. And in the middle, you uh, can see the IKEA Place app, for example. On the left-hand side, there's a similar app by Otto, which is called Your Home. And on the right-hand side, you see um, an example from Shopify, uh, which is really cool because it shows like uh, 
not only one piece, uh, but actually a physical uh, object next to it. So there's uh, one AR model and next to it there's a physical model. And now you can guess which of those uh, two baby strollers is the real one. And um, I leave it to Daniel Beauchamp in his presentation uh, to resolve this. So you can look it up um, uh, on YouTube and uh, figure it out. But I think the, uh, the main catch here is that they are looking strikingly similar. And we are already at a level right now today where you can get a really good idea about the dimensions of an object by putting it into your room with augmented reality and the perspective will match the dimensions will match and you'll you'll know after that if the sofa fits into your room or if it's possibly too large right and um, this has been helping a lot already um, for the retailers to reduce the number of returns for example that they receive and this is costly and it's also annoying for everyone involved uh, to return things that you ordered right so if AR can help us to get a bit better picture before we order something, that's already super helpful. So this is only one of the many reasons why companies are doing this. And there are different challenges attached to this. So one challenge is that many companies are actually not having any 3D files. And uh, they work with, let's say, photos of their products. So where to get G, uh, something like GLTF files, right? Like uh, files that you can use in a real-time setting. And I'll come to that in a moment. Yeah? So uh, we have seen that GLTF is a super useful format and it works pretty well in real-time settings in the web and for AR applications, but how to get 3D models on a large scale. This is a big problem. And then there is another challenge that many retailers face. Even if they already have models, like let's say here on the left-hand side, you can see some pictures from the IKEA catalog and, um, and definitely for the second one here, you can see that it's definitely generated with uh, CGI, right? This is not a photo. So, okay, they have already a lot of 3D models and this doesn't only apply to IKEA, but actually to a lot of retailers out there. So what's the problem? If they already have 3D models, can't they just convert them somehow to GLTF and use them in the real-time application? Well, um, in reality, unfortunately, it's much more complicated. So, on the left hand side you can see like the, that these offline CGI files they are often very large, they come in very specific formats, let's say the 3ds Max scene with V-Ray materials and um, these materials cannot be translated one to one to the real-time materials that are used by GLTF or by other real-time formats. And on the other hand, like one aspect is um, like that these files need to be super compact, super small so that they can be transmitted uh, within just a very few seconds and um, one example is that many retailers say we want to have the asset on the screen within less than three seconds otherwise the shopper may lose their interest and move on and um, to keep them engaged we need these assets uh, to be loading super fast yeah? so this is one other aspect and uh, again here like getting to an optimized GLTF model is the challenge um, even if you already have a base asset that's used for CGI, for example. So this problem is really big. It exists for millions of assets out there. And uh, the first challenge, if you don't have any model, uh, it can be tackled by content creation services. So these are emerging right now. And here are just two examples. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, Shopify experts where you can um, like go and hire uh, like. Uh, workforce that has 3D modeling expertise and they can model your uh, assets, your products from reference photos, for example. And then on the right hand side, you can see a similar service that's called CGI by Otto. So Otto actually has their own CGI service here and it's uh, specifically um, offered for like uh, products like sofas, uh, like furniture pieces, um, and it also helps you to scale up your asset creation if you are coming from that domain. And these are just two examples. Uh, th there are many more, but these are services that are emerging to help with that challenge. And then the second challenge, as said, um, is that uh, even if you have real-time content from some source, you may have to optimize it to have uh, a, con a super compact version that you can use as a final um, publishing version to load within three seconds, for example, on a certain platform. And then usually you're deployed to multiple platforms, so you may even need multiple optimized versions. And uh, there are different ways 
um, to acquire your content and depending on the path that you take to acquire your content there may be different optimization strategies so if you do manual modeling this is one case but then if you have for example something coming from CGI or CAD the challenges are a bit different and for 3D scanning they are again a bit different so just as one very simple example if you have a complex object with a lot of interior parts that you cannot see in the AR version it's always a good strategy to discard these interior parts so well um, for a 3D scan you usually don't have that problem right because the interior parts are not part of the model anyway uh, due to the nature of the scanning process but uh, for CAD models this is often a problem so depending on what kind of data you get you may need different optimization strategies to get it ready for real time and um, th these uh, problems can actually be solved but as said they all require a slightly different pipeline uh, and so for example uh, the typical case, if we receive data from DCC tools, we apply mesh simplification, we bake textures like these PBR maps that are needed for uh, like uh, an appealing realistic uh, model in GLTF, for example, and then apply compression like the uh, mentioned um, basis compression uh, with KTX and so on. So, uh, and again, here's one example like what we get if we are doing this uh, really well. Uh, we get content like this. So just two GLTF examples on the left hand side you can see this object that Brent actually showed during his first presentation and the image that he showed was generated with a path tracer if I recall correctly. This one here is generated in the browser and you can see that they look actually quite similar. So this is uh, generated in real time with uh, Babylon.js and on the right hand side you can see uh, an application of the material variance extension together with some other extensions to get this uh, nice um, yeah, uh, sheen look here for this material. And um, GLTF is really the format of choice for actually all the retailers that we're talking with because they can see that they can map all these um, sometimes complex material properties to this real-time model and it will still be possible to serve this model to a lot of platforms including mobile targets and it will render efficiently so um, this is really a, like um, a really great development and um, while the content creation side is quite complex where we have to deal with a lot of formats on the input side uh, some have 3ds max files some have fbx files or cat files let's say step or uh, whatever it is, then you get uh, 3D scanned data. Um, so while on the content creation side, we have a lot of different formats to deal with, it's very clear what we want to produce in the end um, as an output. And of course, USDZ is another topic. Uh, it's a format that can also be really useful, yeah, but apart from those two, there's not much more um, where it actually would make sense to, to um, export to because GLTF and USDC give us uh, like PBR models that are really widely accepted and can be rendered in a lot of viewers. So um, with that I want to just show a bit of the activities of the 3D Commerce Working Group and specifically the asset creation TSG. As said, the Commerce Working Group brings together leading retailers but also tech companies to work on these pipelines and the asset creation TSG specifically has established already a first version of 3D Asset Creation Guidelines. And uh, if you're interested, please check it out. It's uh, publicly available on GitHub and you can also get involved there directly, for example, by um, commenting, opening tickets or like doing merge requests, participating in discussions. And the Asset Creation Guidelines provide some hints on how to create assets that are easily reusable in a real-time context but also uh, hints on publishing targets. Like if you're a bit unsure, like what I mentioned earlier with this three seconds, um, like what does this mean in terms of file size or polygon count? Uh, if I want to optimize it for mobile targets, uh, can my asset have 500,000 polys or does it need to be 5,000 or what's a good range? Uh, if you have no idea how to start, this is a great starting point because um, there are even abridged versions and um, then uh, you, you can pick the level of detail that you want and look at uh, the aspects that uh, interest you the most. 
and it covers basically all steps um, from yeah, basic asset creation to publishing. And again, it's not limited to GLTF usage, although it's our primary format, but it can be useful for other pipelines as well if you create USDC content, for example. And a typical workflow may be looking like this. So you get a 3D model from CAD, from scanning or classical modeling, and you optimize it, you unwrap it um, to generate new textures and bake them, and then optimize it for publishing targets. So publishing on different platforms. And so with that, I'd like to conclude uh, and um, of course, looking forward to your questions later. So as said, there are a lot of 3D scans, CGI datasets and CAT datasets to be made real-time ready. Um, and automating this process is key if we want to scale it up. And there, 3D standards are really helpful. And specifically, GLTF has been of great help in this context. And there is an ongoing um, discussion between the 3D formats working group and the 3D commerce working group. So I think re GLTF has really been uh, benefiting a lot from this cooperation. So with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, hand it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Max. Uh, I do encourage everyone to take, uh, take a look at the asset creation guidelines. Next up is Dan Frith from IKEA, who will talk to us about GLTF and 3D standardization in IKEA. Dan, you want to take the screen? Thanks, Jeff. And thanks, Max and Brent, for these lovely, uh, deep technical explanations of everything. It's very inspiring. I'm afraid I haven't got something quite so deeply technical, but um, I'm hoping that you find this informative and see how that we are using GOTF as a standard across the company today. Um, so, I mean, just to give you a little bit of background, we started building uh, 3D models in about 2007. The first one was the Bertil chair. And it was um, a experimentation for us to see if it was a you know a good way of working for the company, um, and we did a room set for the catalog in about 2010. Back then, it was a bit of a um, it wasn't necessarily a controversial topic, but it was something that um, the company didn't really understand necessarily, didn't understand the benefits of. So we snuck it in through the back door, and of course, it was one of the room sets that was inspiration you know most inspirational to everybody. So. Then we got more of a go ahead to build more of the scenes up for the company. And then of course there was a technical reason to do 3D for the organization as well, which was if you take uh, the Matud kitchen range, there are a hell of a lot of uh, models and different pieces and components and articles and parts that make up a scene. And to build all those um, in a photography studio was a very expensive and not a very cost-effective way, especially when you're trying to show such a, a broad range so doing this uh, kind of product in 3D really accelerated our offer as a company to sort of visualize and to get product developers to design and conceptualize the product and also then feed it into the kitchen planners, which many people use today. Of course, we've spent many years um, honing our skills and getting ourselves to a place where that we create very high quality 3D images of uh, all of our different range of product. Um, we have to go to a very high detail with all the stitching and the way the expressions work on the fabric uh, and the way the different lighting works in different conditions on different ways. And the interior designers and the product developers are very, you know, they're very involved in this process. They like to make sure that the product is really selling across the kind of expression that it needs. And even though these are just two sofa examples, we see there's like a velvety approach, you know, and as we get closer to this, we have to build in things like zips and all the fabrics. And, you know, we spent many years building up these, you know, very nice high-end uh, computer graphic scenes for IKEA. And a lot of the, uh, I mean, even though the catalog no longer exists and we're not doing the catalog as a full big production anymore. Uh, we produce most of the brochures fully in 3D these days. Uh, a lot of the room sets that you see on the product information pages and the models themselves are computer generated. Um, and again, we spend a lot of time honing that and getting that data and feeding that into the production process so that we can really you know, make a um, top quality offer. But just to give you uh, a bit of an insight of, we're seeing a, um, a new kind of need within the organization now. Um, obviously, as you, all the people present in this know about all the AR offer and GLTF and everything else, that the organization is, is switching onto this now. And we are finding ourselves in a kind of new 
target demographic we're finding ourselves in the new digital product offer where we're trying to create different kinds of um, ways of communicating and selling our range to our customers obviously we in 2019 you know we had most of our production was around images you know from the images you've just seen but we saw around between 2019 2020 we saw a sharper increase in the requirement for and the request for real-time assets um we didn't have any standardization at this point around this and we were experimenting a lot but this increase has gradually gone up and up and up and up and today i mean even though this graph probably shows like 60 percent, i'd say it's probably a higher demand for uh, around interactive 3D in you know, real-time content than it is for images these days. And we're having to build strategies and plans now to, you know, to build up all the resources for that. So just to go through a little bit of the uh, process flow there, a product is um, concepted and ideated. And then with range and product development with 3D platforms, and we can create packaging and we can visualize and we can simulate and we can prototype and conceptualize and also we can use that data in the manufacturing process so 3d is embedded into our ways of working on a daily basis um, and then of course that's really reliant on rich core data and product information so we need position and relation data we need a density of materials we need what type of materials what goes with what and of course using these techniques really gives um, the interior designers and the home furnishing businesses and the business areas within IKEA, the opportunity to experiment with the range. So when we build these assets through these different 3D platforms, not only are we starting with a rich core of data, but we're also starting to build up a library of 3D visualized data. So what we're finding now is that we are um, getting ourselves into a position where that we're having digital versions of the product before we have a physical product. Um, this is a big change for a company like IKEA, which has a um, historical way of working with product development, and it's worked for us in the past. And now we're trying to do a lot of change management to look into how we digitize those processes. Of course, as well, with a 3D process, we can give those uh, files and that data set to where we do supplying and logistics. So could we use this 3D data and these first 3D assets um, into seeing what best fits into a logistics container? What would work best in a warehouse if we started to use lensware to work through a warehouse and navigate the warehouse and knowing what goes with what and store availability? And so 3D becomes really core and integral to what we do as an organization. And just to touch back on the range experimentation, this gives us the opportunities with 3D as a core and this data to really let the markets experiment and let ourselves experiment what's relevant in different sectors because a global range isn't necessarily relevant in say you know, within Japan or within Canada so with 3D as a foundation we can define and modify and conceptualize the range in a better way and also it's a more creative process as well because then the people who develop the range can experiment with what goes with what. With 3D processes, it's easy for us to swap textures out. It's easy for us to experiment with different materials, even change the shape and size of a product. We can also bring health and safety regulations into it. So this product must be snapped to a wall. This product cannot be put in front of a window. So with 3D platforms, we can really revolutionize the way we work. And also we can feed that data through the organization. And then of course, with this data set, we can convert this into a way that benefits the whole company. So today we use 3D content in store planning. So when you go to a big blue box, there's uh, someone already has sat there and planned where everything should go. There are some principles for retail that certain things go with certain areas. And with store, there's a big store planning team. I believe it's like nearly 8,000 people who store, who plan where the assets go. So with a root and a core of 3D data to facilitate that flow, it's really important that we convert in a way that they can use. And the same thing happens with customer planning. We have many, many, uh, over 30 different planning and configuration platforms today, and they contribute to an enormous amount of the revenue of the company. And they are 
either using 3D today in an image base or they're using 3D in a real-time base. And the uh, plan and the strategy moving forward is to hopefully move much more towards the real-time way of working. And therefore, of course, standardization is very key and important. Of course, we also use this uh, converted 3D content for high-end images. We found that in the first stage of 3D content, closer to product development, it's more a visualization of data. So it might not necessarily have expressions in fabric. It might not necessarily have weld seams. So when two metals are joined together, it might not be able to show how those are fitting and how they work. And of course, we need those kind of details and that kind of level of quality for the communication to promote and sell a product either through images or through other formats. Then of course it's real time and I'm gonna focus on that in a second. But also we have a lot of this content with meeting the customer. So IKEA is, has a big retail organization and we have a main franchise all section of the organization and we together work on a way in which we can build the range with 3D to put it in front of the customer in an inspirational way and hopefully get them to fully understand what the range is about. And yeah, I'm gonna come on to that now. So if we, just to talk a little bit about the real time, the process that we put in place about real time focus, um, and you've seen some of this from uh, Max earlier. Um, we have high resolution 3D files, they're Max files and V-Ray shaders. Um, we experiment with other ones as well, but they, that's primarily the main core is built around Max and V-Ray. We convert these to GLTF files today. So it's a really high resolution file. It's converted to a GLTF file. And then we use an automated decimation pipeline. I say it's automated. There's a little bit of handholding in there. Um, today, we use Rapid Compact. And you saw Max talking about that today. Um, and then what this enables is this gives us the opportunity to create a large array of 3D assets. So the isolated quality profile that we go for, um, we've produce three levels of detail in GLTF and GLB, GLB, Draco and USDZ, because these are the formats that the markets need in order to communicate the product on their digital platforms. Um, we found that three levels of detail was a good way of getting into different platforms, different areas. A planner, if you're gonna be using it in a different environment, might need a lower level of detail, or if you're just gonna be showing it on a product information page as a product on its own, maybe a high level of detail is good. But then what we also found is that we needed to create something called a relational quality profile. Um, and what this became is like a different level of detail, different density of geometry um, when we put product together. So if you picture a product on its own on a blank white section of, a web, of the IKEA website and it's spinning on its own, the isolated profile is good. But if you want to then put it in a room set in a planner or like Ikea Place or Geomagical or in Ikea Place or whatever. So then you could you have to put multiple products in the same room set. So what we couldn't do then was use that same high resolution real time asset. We had to build another flow for lower quality, but also still make sure we maintain the same quality level and the same um, the same sign off quality assurance processes are met within that. To give you a bit of an insight of what this means in regards to volume, um, we have about 15, we had about 15 and a half thousand uh, product in 3D within IKEA's volume. You probably thought it was more than that, but actually there's, there's only about 45,000 or 30 to 45,000 products that are available for sale within the organization. So then we have, we had a quite a large volume, about 40% of the volume was available in 2018. We had three levels of detail on high resolution files. That's why there's a 47,000 there. But by 2019, we needed to build that level up because we needed to communicate more, more and more the organization wanted to use 3D. So we built that up to about 55% of the range. Um, and that was about 22,000, 21,500 products and about 65,000 assets. And then still by 2020, we still didn't have much of a production pipeline in place around real time because our focus and our energy, and you know, it's a lot of, it's a, it's a big organization. There's a lot of production planning that has to go on. So by 2020, we had about 70% of the range in high resolution max files and V-ray shaders. There's about 27,500 models with about 82,000 models. So about 27,500 product. Um, that sounds like a lot of product and it really is. Um, but when you might have a chair that's for sale in the UK versus a chair, the exact same chair that's for sale in Japan, 
there might be different foams, different backboards, different legs, different materials that are needed to sell that product in different areas of the world. So when you get into that scale, it turns into an enormous amount of 3D models that are needed. So by 2021, we knew we had to really catch up with the real time part. So we built more high resolution models, of course, because that was part of our production plan. But we also then started to really catch up on our real time production. So by the end of 2021, we got to about 20,800. That was the plan to get to about that amount of articles in real time, which is about 250,000 models um, with all the levels of detail. Don't forget, you just saw GLTF, GLB, GLB Draco, USDZ. So there's like three, six, nine, 12 versions of each of those. Then you've got isolated and relational as well. So it's a hell of a lot of uh, items and max files and 3D files there. And then, of course, by the, the ambition is to by 2022 that we have everything that's a high resolution file and we have everything in real time. This has been a challenge, I won't lie. It's been a complex task for us because of resource um, and to get the skills we need into the organization. So, um, but it's a well oiled production facility. There's a lot of people there who do it. Um, and we're always looking for really great, skilled, talented people to come and help us with this production. Um, and the need around these assets, because IKEA produces a few thousand new products every year and we bring some products out, we're always going to need to produce more assets. And we're always finding new ways of producing digital product that needs different types of you know, these assets and different types of product. So to give you an example of how we use these products, um, you saw this from Max a little while ago. This is uh, a little video from IKEA Place. So what we did is... Um, we actually built a lot of our assets into um, GLTF and GLB and Draco and USDZ because, of course, we can't. We have to make sure that the product works on Apple devices and Android devices. So we have to make sure we cover all the much of a demographic as we possibly can. Um, the range was hard to get in place by that time. I believe, if I remember right, we had about seven thousand product in there. Um, which was good. It covered a lot of what people needed. Um, but we had some technical issues. We had some complexities with the product, um, which was okay. Um, it was it a was really, um, really good digital product for us to make. And we hadn't really made an AR platform at that point. Um, and so we actually turned it around with a crack force of people in about nine, 10 weeks, which was we were really happy with. It wasn't 7,000 assets that time. We continued to add assets as we went along. Um, but I'm sure most people know about it. It was, it was a very successful application and it's continued to be. And we continue to add more um, components to it, like snapping to walls and we're snapping to different areas. And in, so we, we're adding more and more to it. Um, there is a successor to this that we're working on at the moment called um, IKEA Studio. And that um, has been looking at how we use LiDAR tech and scan rooms and place products in different ways within that. And we can hopefully reuse a lot of that content, even though I would say the quality level has changed a little bit since then. So, but there's much work we're doing around that. So we're looking into how to expand upon this as a product. I've talked about the um, planners before. So this is the uh, PAX planner. Um, and then here we are just throwing some real-time assets around the scene, uh, GLTF files and all the assets I've told you about before. This is obviously web-based, it's not mobile-based, even though obviously you can interact with it on mobile, but you, um, through web platform. But the uh, idea is that these are much simpler assets. So we found that with the planners, because of the level of complexity and the accuracy that's needed, because in a planner, you need to know what hinge, you need to have all the hinges and all the bolts and all the details and the handles and the screws and everything needs to be in there, that we had to almost make a really bespoke pipeline for these solutions. Because even though this is just a simple um, product in front of us now, you could fill a room with different products and you've got to make sure the refresh rate and the frame rate is still high and it's still good to go with. Um, and of course, we've got the kitchen planner, which uh, again, same type of assets. There's actually been some um, procedural modeling done with this so we can scale kitchen worktops up and down and different areas, but the majority of the product um, is from fairly low resolution 3D assets and we're putting it in the scenes and the customer can then just easily customize. I mean, with this option here, you can 
choose one of several different um, suggested inspirational options around your room space. So you have a planner, you draw out the size of your space. So you measure at home, you tell us where you want, where your window is, where your water is, where the doors are, and then you can customize into 3D and get it to look exactly as you want it to. And of course, all these inspirational versions that come up help hopefully inspire you to uh, connect with the products and the range. But again, connecting back to the level of complexity, there are tens of thousands of products in a range like this. So combinations, especially. So I could change a drawer to one of many different colors. I could change different, many different materials, different types of sink, different types of full sets, different types of handles. And it's all got to happen instantly. It's got to happen straight off. You can't wait for it to be spinning around, for it to be updated. So the idea is that we have to make assets small. We have to make them accessible. We have to make them easy to throw into no matter what platform you're on. So if I'm running on a really old laptop or a new laptop or looking through a mobile web platform, it needs to be running quick and efficiently. Then we've done some work recently um, with a company called, we acquired a company called Geomagical Labs in San Francisco, and they uh, have been helping us develop a, uh, well, they've developed them together, we've been developing a way of scanning rooms. So we're scanning rooms through mainly photogrammetry, um, and then you like do this, you're waving it around in this like infinity loop, it's taking pictures, and then it's building a three-dimensional scan of your room. Um, and then, of course, you can erase different products from the room. So you can take out your own service. You can put the product on top. Um, the idea is that you can then have these high quality assets that I showed you in the slides before, throw them into this scene and then customize and inspire. It's not so much necessarily an in, in, accurate kitchen planner because that's a different type of thing. That's why I showed the slides before. This is more a way of showing cushions and chairs and tables and accessories and sofas and products to inspire you to buy a, a range and, and furbish, you know, your, furnish your house. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're near completion on this. We're not far off. Um, we're launching it in different markets um, and it's, it's, it's going really well. Um, there are still some questions in regards to the PBRs and some like where it's lighting, but, it, but it's fantastic. It's, it's moving in a really good direction. But to come to um, one of the reasons we've had to standardize uh, is because when we started to um, build 3D assets across the organization, we didn't really have a standardized approach. Look at those slides I had earlier when we didn't have the 3D assets. We were seeing 3D assets being built in different parts of the organization that we weren't very happy with. I mean, even though people were trying, they were trying to connect and sell the range, and that's fantastic. They felt there was a need in their markets to use this technology. Um, and these rendered images, you know, are beautiful and are 3D images. But when we get to a um, real-time version of it, we weren't hitting the quality level we really wanted to hit. Um, they looked a little flat. They looked a little, you know, misshapen. So what we decided as an organization was install some kind of standardization across so that... The, you know, the whole company pulls on one central repository. And I put this in here to show you the kind of differences we had, where the, one of these is the actual 3D model of a Strandmon chair, and one of these is a, another part of the organization making a version of the 3D model of a Strandmon chair. And as you can see, the design is different. We had some model problems. We had, um, we had inconsistencies. And one of the things that we need to be really strong on as an organization is to make sure that a digital version of our product matches the physical as close as humanely possible. So this is another reason for installing standardization so that we can't show the customer a product that doesn't actually map the pro match the product. And it's incredibly critical for us as a company to do that. So again, you know, a need for standardization um, has been incredibly important across the organization. I would say that within retail in many parts of the organization, it's been really well received because we've built a central repository. We're adding to it weekly. It's going up and up and up and up and up. And then we give the organization the space to innovate and be a bit entrepreneurial to experiment with different types of range. Um, sorry, I meant to go to this slide. So I'll just go back to this quite quickly. So then with our rich core data, we can standardize this. And this is the whole point about us doing it at a range of product development level. 
Um, and of course, this means we can um, be creative in an unconstrained in a way and hopefully bring sustainability and circularity back to that process. Of course, we build these 3D based images. Um, we, uh, we have this high quality imagery based on these 3D images that you've seen already today. Um, they're high resolution models and shaders. But then with standards in place, like we've talked about um, with GLTF, GLB, Draco and USDZ, um, and then using like Babylon JS viewers, we can distribute um, approved and quality assured content to fulfill the business need. Um, and with standards in place as well, we can make sure that digital products are built in a way to leverage and pull on this content rather than um, it be developed in a way that there has to be extra conversions in place. Um, we are looking into how, again, we use these standardized content and digital products uh, across, especially with the supply and logistics. Um, we see a huge efficiency in that process, and we see huge benefits for using this within that part, of the world, especially when it comes to things like packaging. You know, you could use 3D assets to better define how products fit in a cardboard box. Um, of course, the planning and configuration is uh, very important. You know, we've been through a lot of that today already. Um, but again, leveraging on a consistent common content library, our planners and configurators can reuse that content across multiple platforms. So what we're hoping with that approach is that no matter what platform you're in or whatever configurator you're in, that um, you will see a consistency in the product that you meet. And then I guess the, the, the last part of this is to, you know, with this consistency and the standardization and this ability to have a digital replica of the physical product that we can stand behind, we can um, inspire our customers and, and they will feel secure that they'll meet the same physical product when they uh, go to the store. So again, consistency is really key, um, building up this library of consistent data and consistent assets and materials, you know, and with the Kronos group and 3D Commerce and the groups that we're in, using this standardized approach has really helped us. Like I've already touched on, probably repeating myself a little bit as well now, but the virtual and physical accuracy is a really key important part. We could only achieve that through standardization. We couldn't achieve that through just throwing a document out or saying, you know, this is how we work. We had to start building a standardized library. It was the only way we could accurately do it. Um, to be fair, we had to do a lot of installation of agreements and principles and guidelines within the organization. So we knew what we were working with. And of course, it's a big journey. There's a lot of change management involved in that as well. So we can't just switch this on overnight. This is a huge change for a company like IKEA, um, but it's one that's embraced by a lot of the organization, which is fantastic. And of course, the purpose of doing this consistency is of course to enable brand trust as well. I talked before about having more of our demographic is interacting with our products on digital platforms before they go to a store. So either that's through a browser or through AR, you know, we know we'll see people interacting with it through XR or, you know, and we will see more and more people experimenting, laying products out in their rooms, either through products like Geomagical or IKEA Studio, IKEA Place or the planners and the configurators. So with that, we have to make sure that when that product is bought, that it creates that brand trust because otherwise, um, and that's something we always stand very proud of and we're very, you know, we want to make sure we stand behind. That's me, Jeff. Um, so I kind of, I could take some questions. I know I'm a little early, but uh, I thought we might be. Jeff. Um, let's just go ahead and move on to the next presenter, actually. Okay. Uh, cool. Thank you so much, Daniel. Peter? No problem at all. Yes. Let's go ahead and have Peter begin. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, please uh, let me welcome everyone. I would like to talk about how did GLTF standards save uh, our uh, R&D project. So... Uh, I will cover short, uh, short intro on what is we are and how our institute is involved in uh, the virtual reality technologies. The main focus um, will be on how the GLTF standard became the common language between the different stakeholders uh, 
within uh, our project. So first of all, what is Hey, I'm in New York reality? City. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. What's going on here? Yeah, uh, the main concept, uh, as we heard, is to show a stereoscopic image to create the feeling that uh, being in another place. So uh, our institute is dealing with VR technologies for a decade now. In uh, 2009, uh, we built a human-sized immersive display. Uh, 12 years ago, that was the only option to create an immersive experience for the users. Beyond immersive virtual reality technologies, hardware technology, uh, we created uh, software solutions uh, for remote telemanipulation of industrial manufacturing uh, systems. Uh, we successfully finished uh, five international R&D projects during the last decade. Five years ago, we published our free and open source virtual reality software library called Apertus VR. All of the uh, all of our international R and D projects were based on uh, Apertus VR. Yep. Uh, so let's dive into virtual uh, learning factory gamification environment and the usage of GLTF standard during the implementation of the project. The member of the consortium uh, comes from Sweden, Italy, Estonia, and Hungary. Uh, one of the goals of the project was to create a virtual reality-based uh, gamification environment for industrial engineer teachers and students to allow them to analyze the processes associated with manufacturing uh, products, sees the capabilities and processing times of uh, the manufacturing uh, machines, monitor failures and analyze related statistics and uh, identify system bottlenecks. Um, as you can see, we had a highly interdisciplinary environment software engineers, um, manufacturing engineers, professors, teachers, and 3D artists needed to work together efficiently to deliver the final product on time. Since the 3D artists and manufacturing engineers already use 3D modeling tools, the whole development chain contain external software vendors as well. Moreover, software engineers are also use external rendering software libraries from other software vendors. So let me say that was a pain. But fortunately, the relief uh, just was within reach. The GLTF file format for, uh, for, 3D, for 3D scenes and models have united the different groups and disciplines within the Virtual Learning Factory Toolkit project. GITF is the only royalty-free scene descriptor with photorealistic options that are supported by all stakeholders of, uh, of our project. Internal stakeholders, including software engineers, manufacturing engineers, professors, te teachers, and 3D artists, are use the GITF standard as a common 3D asset format. External stakeholders, Coders such as 3D modeling tools and rendering engines, uh, open source uh, software libraries, um, and so on, offers uh, exporters and importers supporting GLTF for rapid virtual reality content generation. This royalty free uh, standard. Uh, GLTF enables to interoperate use of 3D content across these different stakeholders by the efficient transmission and loading of 
3D scenes and models by engines and applications. We'd like to skip it, do it, show this video. We'll probably zoom a little bit. Okay. So um, let me show some screen videos about this gamification environment. We created a space for teachers to upload their content. Moreover, a lobby allows to start stop their uploaded lectures. Uh, yeah. Yeah, as you can see, uh, after the teachers start the room, then the students are able to enter this room and allow them to mutually analyze the processes associated with manufacturing products, assess the capabilities and processing times of machines, monitor failures and analyze related statistics, identify system bottlenecks. And um, they can do with that uh, process within a realistic representation of a manufacturing system. Yeah, I would like to show the single player mode as well. Yeah, as you can see, the teacher is able to manipulate uh, the, the simulation uh, by a 3D graphical user interface. The teacher is able to, to run or stop uh, the, the animation, uh, which comes from the ontology-based uh, manufacturing simulation. So the whole uh, manufacturing, the simulation of the manufacturing uh, system can be inspected mutually by the student and teachers. So thank you, that's all from my side. Thank you and let me know if you have any further questions during the question and answer session. Thank you, Peter, for the fascinating presentation. Our next presenter is Tem Balina from Esri, who will present a case study on GLTF and geospatial. Tem, would you like to grab the screen? Yes, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about uh, GLTF and uh, 3D GIS. Uh, as uh, Jeff said, I'm Tamara Blina, I'm senior software engineer with Esri, and uh, I've worked with uh, 3 for a while. And uh, I would like to present to you guys today what we've been doing uh, for the past many years uh, with GLTF and 3D GIS. Um, so GIS, uh, is really advancing in uh, 3D in areas of uh, uh, buildings, uh, cityscapes, or landscapes. Generally, we call this geos geospatial infrastructure. There is a huge movement in trying to create a digital twin, a replica, if you will, a digital replica of the real world, and be able to present that in 3D and interact with it, uh, manage it, uh, manage assets, uh, networks such as utilities, and pipelines, and road lines. Uh, or uh, buildings. Um, so this movement has been going on for many years and now we're at the forefront where uh, almost everything needs to be done also at the web. 
And this is where uh, GLTF comes into play, uh, where we use GLTF for visual consistency, uh, for uh, uh, sharing between various and uh, disparate uh, applications uh, that output 3D. Um, so GLTF is used in that context. So um, as I'm just showing you through all these different uh, use cases, uh, I would like to just uh, um, uh, go back to the premise where we actually use it. So uh, ISRI, uh, we uh, try to make content available for all platforms, uh, whether it's running on desktop, mobile, or browser. We love to be able to have the same content, the same asset available on all these platforms. And our users request it, demand it. And the way that we do that is by, um, uh, by using an open standard uh, called the Index 3D Scene Layer, or I3S, that allows you to stream massive amount of geospatial content, uh, meshes, point cloud, uh, or uh, any of the geospatial assets that we have could be streamed into this format. This is an OGC open standard format that supports stream content. Um, the format actually allows you or supports uh, five types of uh, distinct layer types. Uh, 3D objects, uh, you know, your classic uh, 3D buildings, uh, 3D shapes, buildings, trees, and whatnot are uh, one layer type that are supported. Um, and the other layer type, which actually uh, now relates very much to GLTF, is a point scene layer where, uh, where it's a, a point location that could be symbolized by any 3D object. And that 3D object, in this case, could be GLTF. And um, this allows you also to visualize uh, attributes by size or by color, applying thematic or stylistic um, uh, content to your data. Um, the other one that we see a whole lot more is uh, integrated mesh scene layer. This we call it a skin of the earth type of layer where both geometry and texture are integrated into a single asset and into single uh, uh, format and can be streamed uh, very efficiently. Um, it can be captured, uh, you know, using satellite imagery or, uh, or drones uh, to generate uh, 3D meshes. Um, yet the other two formats that we have in this format are point cloud scene layer, um, you know, collected by LIDAR, uh, photogrammetric points, and uh, to uh, capture both elevation uh, and also classification of data. Uh, and then lastly, a building scene layer is uh, uh, very detailed building models, uh, typically imported from different formats, such as Revit, uh, and allows this filtration and categorization of uh, different parts of the building so that you can actually visualize an asset, the asset now more thoroughly. So these are the context or these are the different uh, type of layers that um, we uh, use and our users use uh, throughout in their work. And, and what we're seeing now is there's this uh, uh, confluence or uh, emerging point where uh, this database driven assets, uh, 3D features that are symbolized by, you know, points or uh, some attribute and also being able to merge that or fuse that with meshes. These are 3D meshes that are captured, reality captured and being able to do that at the same time is a very highly demanded and uh, sought after feature that our users have been uh, pushing us for. Um, but you see, in this, uh, uh, in this context, it's not only just visualization. Uh, our users demand being able to do, you know, measurement, uh, being able to actually, uh, being able to uh, do analytical processes also on this application. In this case, you'll see on the terrain line of sight uh, or being able to uh, do pointers is, 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 is a requirement that our user base uh, would uh, put on us. Um, yet another uh, use case that we would see it is in uh, sort of like urban development or scenario A versus scenario B kind of scenarios, where uh, we would be able to see, for example, this is kind of Mary's pose uh, analytical process where uh, we have a line of sight, you know, which line of sight is better, is it uh, scenario A or scenario B, and this is in urban redevelopment or in uh, urban planning scenarios as very typically used, uh, but then also be able to, you know, include uh, shadow analysis or be able to integrate the shadow, like how much of the area is going to be covered by a shadow. And this could be very, very uh, important decision when you're trying to do planning or 
building in your apartment or office complex and uh, where temperature might be uh, temperature uh, might be a concern uh, would be uh, would be good to see you know how much of the area will be covered in the shadow and then uh, other use cases are as I mentioned earlier this merging confluence of uh, modeling a realistic data uh, to schematic or thematic data. Now, this is the same content, the same data that you saw that was, uh, you know, that is kind of morphing from uh, texture-based thematic data to uh, thematic and now to like hand-drawn representation. Again, this is stylization, right? Now, being able to stylize the same content, uh, whether it has very rich texture and asset uh, or to um, have it more like draw like this, uh, very schematic uh, type of uh, rendering is also uh, important for uh, most of our users. Um, in areas of like climate change and disaster response, again, this is where the merging of the uh, attribute or database driven data, uh, for example, in this case, in you know, 100 year flood uh, line, establishing that and seeing the change over time, how, how much of the area would be impacted if, if there was X amount of flooding over years, over amount of years, uh, you'd be able to visualize that and see what would be impacted. As you can see in this slide, while still keeping the visual attractiveness of you know reflection and um, uh, shadows uh, within the scene itself, and then again, GLT plays a role in that. Um, moving on a little bit, um, they talked about you know being able to um, uh, being able to. Uh, use, uh, for example, this is a building scene there, one of the layer types that is supported in I3S, and being able to peel through the data. Uh, here, we're doing like a slice, a volume slice of the content, and being able to isolate a content or, or an object. Uh, for example, the stairs have been isolated, not, not to be peeled through, so that you can actually measure, mensurate that exact object that you are interested in. And again, uh, this is where we'd see like, you know, if a user had a higher model or a higher fidelity content could be implanted as a GLTF asset and could be visualized within the system itself as a whole. Um, so I talked about, you know, uh, GLTF and where it could be, uh, where it could play a role in the different use cases that I just showed. But primarily, uh, we see GLTF as being able to obtain this consistency uh, on all our platforms. And when we began, it was really a web, a web uh, resource, a web asset, and that's what we were using it. But really, we're finding out now, uh, whether we're running desktop, mobile, or other platforms, GLTF is more and more serving that role, uh, being able to have that you know, consistency across application, across platforms, uh, is very uh, crucial and uh, important for us. Um, just to show you real quick some some of the workflows. So you know the GIS analyst, the GIS uh, user would uh, use you know probably desktop applications that you see here on the right to author, create content, and then uh, have also a need to be able to interface with third party application, your Maya, 3D Max, whatever you'd call it. Uh, there is uh, always a reason to interface with uh, third-party apps, and here again you see uh, just like the other, you know, 3D model assets, OBJs and Colatus and whatnot. Um, GLTF uh, again taking the modern role, the new role of being that glue, that asset that serves as a lingua franca between these uh, different different applications. Uh, this is both, you know, input output, so. Again, we see that also really uh, uh, evolving over time. Um, I, now, in geospatial, there's always uh, the business of you know position, georeferencing the object. Uh, most of our asset, if not all, lives in some geo uh, location in some real world uh, X Y Z uh, coordinate system, and. Uh, being able to actually tie that GLTF model with uh, the dual reference as a dual reference model is also a key interest in, in the area or in the, in the fields that we work. Uh, the asset creation, the asset modeling could be done on all, you know, uh, assuming it's concerned only in the asset model space, but when that asset is brought into, uh, is typically uh, in our world is brought into play with other assets as well that are also dual reference, dual scale. And uh, that is actually uh, kind of a 
differentiator in the geospatial space where GLTF is being used. Uh, it's always, almost always used in uh, geo-referenced geo, geo, geo uh, context. Um, looking at the different industries and sectors that actually play with, uh, with, with this, uh, yeah, again, as I said, from your typical GIS specialist to a city planner, a data visualizer to an urban designer, all these different, you know, uh, professions, if you will, would be able to interface with it or interfacing with it, maybe not necessarily knowing that they're dealing with a GLTF per se, but uh, comes in, in, in their workflow, in their everyday workflow, as they manage to import data from one format to another format and being able to visualize it in the 3D GIS system. So it does cover a lot of uh, areas, uh, from game developers to, you know, uh, uh, research scientists and whatnot, uh, being able to have one, one model, one format uh, that could, you know, cross cut across all these different industries has been really uh, important and key for us. Uh, so in the ArcGIS ecosystem, uh, this is uh, the uh, a desktop and web application that uses it. GLTF is supported almost everywhere. Um, uh, we, our web application, the ArcGIS API for JavaScript supports uh, loading and displaying uh, GLTF. Um, ArcGIS Pro, which is our desktop application, so also supports that. Um, and uh, across the variety of uh, applications that we have, uh, desktop, mobile, and, uh, uh, and web, GLTF is supported. And we're working more and more to incorporate more features, more uh, uh, options as it comes to extensions or the core standard and integrating that into the uh, application and the uh, use, use cases that they've seen. Um, quickly, another use case here where uh, we have uh, used it, uh, typically uh, where you'd see GLTF is really uh, in, in areas of uh, asset creation. So this is a uh, citizen engagement collaboration application, one simple application that we put for a demonstration uh, that you know, folks would be able to design in real time and be able to put their input. You know, Hey, would love to see that you know, there's a park here, there's uh, uh, buildings and whatnot. Uh, but you know, this, all of these assets that came up that you see could be, or in this use case are actually in the form of GLTF. Um, um, but not only that, you, you know, the application is integrated or this use case is integrated that you can even bring in, um, you know, other formats in the form of GLTF, like the brain that you just see here and be able to uh, put it right there in the app and then submit this plan for citizen engagement or collaborative planning, for example. Um, now switching gears real quick. Uh, one area that we've been really uh, working with the uh, three formats groups and others in the community has been uh, trying to really uh, take advantage of uh, new features that are coming out. So support for KTS, the KTX2 or basis has been very crucial for us and being able to have that has been, uh, has been very important that we actually collaborated with uh, binomial the creators of basis to improve one area of uh, GLT, one area of KTX store basis that oftentimes uh, might not be, uh, you know, as, uh, as important for most, which is the amount of time that it takes to create that content. Uh, in our use case is very critical because we don't, not only we deliver the assets that are the fully, you know, optimized GLTF or 3D models that our customers can use, we also give them the tools to do that. So being able to say, create that and KTX2 model, uh, a model containing a KTX2 as fast as possible is very, very key for us. So with this collaboration with, uh, with Binomial, we're able to actually improve that, the basis for KTX2 creation by four times. This is the creation aspect. Consumption has been always good and uh, it's already too fast anyways. So there has never been an issue, but the context creation or the data creation really needed uh, to be improved. And we're really happy and glad to contribute back to the community. Uh, this work uh, in collaboration with uh, Binomial to be able to you know, create uh, a basis uh, content, content uh, and about four times, uh, you know, four times uh, speed improvement. Um, and this is, has a real world impact, you know. So if you look at one asset, one format that um, this is called SLPK that typically we used to deliver was, uh, you know, 
JPEG plus some uh, compressed texture format DDS in this case. Look at the asset size, it, it really 42% uh, less when we go to KTX2. This is huge real assets. This is bits that are streamed over the network that are not now and huge amount of uh, data saving. And this one example from 26 gigabyte to 11 gigabyte is very uh, significant. Uh, but as you can see, you know, the time is still, 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 you know, uh, a huge amount of improvement. And this is after the four hours. So there's more work to be done and we're still working with them to still improve that uh, asset creation speed and uh, be able to uh, be able to improve it. And uh, in the slides, you'll get it. Uh, you'll be able to see, you know, what are the kind of, because in the geospatial world, the kind of assets and the kind of resources that, uh, that are uh, typically used might be a little bit different than uh, elsewhere in the commerce world. Or, uh, so we kind of focused on really creating this uh, uh, KDX2 uh, specifically uh, optimized also for uh, geospatial use cases and be able to see you know, uh, the results and you can uh, learn more about this work in uh, this plot. Uh, I would like to really quickly jump on and just show you uh, this live actually. Um, so um, I might have it open, but that's okay. Um, so what you see here is um, is uh, on the uh, right is the same content though there's KTX2, on the left is uh, it was JPEG. And if I zoom in further, what I would love for you to see here is this information down at the bottom, the memory uh, usage. And uh, Brent had uh, shown some slides yeah, originally that actually illustrated that as well, but you can see it real time live. Uh, 200 megabytes versus, you know, here in the case of uh, JPEG, 500 megabytes of uh, local memory used in this particular instance. This is the JPEG, you know, expanded to RGB versus KDX. That's how much saving that, that you know, using KTX2 brings to the table. And this is huge. This is really huge uh, in our workflow, in our uh, use case. This is a really big uh, improvement that we're, we're really loving and want to see more and more in GLTF and other assets uh, as well. And then uh, lastly, I have uh, maybe one or one or two slides. Um, slide. So, um, one other area that I would love to mention is, as I said, we work on all platforms, uh, whether it's desktop or uh, mobile or uh, web. And one other area that we're seeing huge uh, impact and also reduction is in game engines. Geospatial and game engines is really becoming big. And here also we see GLTF uh, playing a role, uh, maybe not immediately right now, but in the future, uh, there's a huge role there for GLTF as well. And uh, typically in our use case, where we would see it is, again, uh, whether it's a city, global, uh, scale data visualization, uh, or focused on, uh, focused on, uh, focused on, um, you know, uh, this, for example, on the right, in the video on the right that you see I'm scrolling through is um, in the context of uh, reviewing architecture models uh, within the city. This is a VR experience. You are reviewing the model. You are seeing it. Again, that visual consistency is still key because typically users start with a web browser or a desktop application, and then also be able to do this in a VR uh, system is also a huge, uh, uh, a huge uh, impact for our users. Um, and then um, I'll skip this two slides. Um, this is some work we've been doing in uh, bringing and being able to convert from different format, for example, from 3D tiles to I3S that. Uh, that uh, also contain uh, GLTF and uh, some open work uh, uh, that we've contributed back to the community. Um, again, you would have this uh, slides in the uh, this uh, this uh, slides in the slide. And then finally, just uh, my last slide. Um, so the current trend is really pointing for three D WebGIS to become the primary interface, and then again, where uh, we see GLTF to be playing a major role uh, in that in that in that space. Uh, out of the box functionality without no coding in the geospatial community is really key, but still also having this robust API for, you know, JavaScript based application and uh, configurable application is also very essential. Uh, the geospatial user expects this consistency of experience, data quality between web desktop and mobile experience, and we GLTF is uniquely positioned to serve that purpose. 
uh, now fragmentation of features between various browsers is still a risk going forward, but with wider adoption, I hope this would be uh, less of a problem. Thanks much. Thank you, Tam. That was a great presentation. I appreciate it. Thank Next you. up, we'll have an open Q&A session with our GLTF experts to answer any questions you may have. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature. If I can have the speakers turn on their cameras, that would be wonderful. The panel will be led by Brent Scannell from Autodesk and our GLTF Working Group Chair. Brent? Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm having an issue turning on my video because it says the host has stopped it. <laughs> VC can fix that for you. Yep, I should have that for you in two seconds. Perfect. Thank you, VC. Okay, we have a bunch of questions that came in and some of them have been answered. I think it'd be worthwhile to maybe review some of them live. Let me just figure this out. Perfect. That's working out. Awesome. Um, and I'm going to try to do my best to either answer or deflect as many questions as I can. Uh, but we have a great host, uh, a great list of panelists and, and experts on the line here who are, are ready to answer. Um, <clears throat> first question uh, that maybe is worth um, going into. Da -da 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 -da. So there's some questions about materials. I mean, we're happy to have uh, Ed Mackey on the line here, who uh, is the chair of the uh, PBR working group within uh, 3D formats. There's a question about um, physically based reflective materials and empty object related animation. Uh, I know you answered that uh, kind of in the chat there, Ed, but uh, is there any other color that you can add to that um, or that you would wanna maybe go into a bit deeper? Uh, thanks, Brent. Um, there's, okay, so the, the simplest way to get a reflective material is since we're using the, the PBR roughness metallic uh, model is, is just to uh, assign a, a metal surface and make it smooth and you can get a reflective surface coming off of that. More recently we've well we've released a, a newer uh, KHR materials extension uh, called KHR materials specular um, and that allows you to control the specular colors even on uh, non-metallic uh, dielectric materials. Um, and that replaces an earlier extension we had called PBR specular glossiness. Um, we replaced the older one because it was a whole separate workflow that was separate from the metal rough workflow. So we have a newer version of that that fits into the metal work, uh, metal rough workflow now. And I answered this in the chat, but yes, you can have an empty node in a GLTF and you can animate that uh, position, orientation, scale, all that stuff. Awesome. Thank you, Ed. Um, again, if, if that doesn't answer the question fully, please feel free to put more questions in the chat. We will get to as many as we can. Um, question for the group. How would one figure out, you know, which renderers, viewers, or tools in the ecosystem support which extensions? You know, we presented a lot of different new developments that are all through these extensions. How does one, how does one make a choice? Um, I see maybe Max, you're uh, starting to type an answer. Um. Do I? Uh, <laughs> I was just looking at the chat because Eric Chadwick, thanks, uh, Eric, uh, posted something here. So uh, there's a comparison from Model Fewer, uh, the Model Fewer guys, and there's actually some work where maybe we can, uh, um, like, you know, Leonard, maybe uh, you can answer some parts from the Kronos side uh, because there's a certification TSG that also allows us to compare and rank the outcome of different viewers which is not um, only about extensions, it's also about things like even if you have the same support, um, how exactly do you render something correctly, uh, including post-processing and things like that. But um, yeah, maybe Leonard can give a better picture here like about that scope of the certification TSG. So before I go into the certification, I do want to point out there's projects, <clears throat> excuse me, Project Explorer, which allows you to, to find a lot of viewers and, and other GLTF support tools. Uh, and that is available on the Kronos uh, GLTF GitHub account. And somebody, I'm sure at some point, will be posting soon the uh, details of that access. But project, uh, the certification program, and there's the Project Explorer link. The certification program, and that URL is now in the chat, is designed to 
ensure that viewers who want to meet the 3D Commerce certification and use the certification logo all achieve the same standards in rendering. And it requires just the KHR Texture Transform extension. So it's not a good measure of are all these extensions available or which extensions are available, but it, you have to know that the rendering is going to be at a sufficient quality. And the, the uh, page there with links to the GitHub and the other pieces of the certification program to provide all the details. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you for that complete answer and thank you for the links. Um, again, if you have more questions about that, please repost them, we'll, we'll go into more detail. Um, question directed at Daniel from Ikea. <clears throat> you showed a slide where the need for high-res imagery is reducing over time in favor of real-time models. Why do you keep creating real uh, high res models? <laughs> Good question. Because uh, um, we need those high resolution models to be converted in order to create the other ones in the first place. And because we do, we still will do image, you know, image rendering, real time assets um, aren't the high quality we need to like zoom in. That's why in like, I think it was slide four or five, I showed a close up of the materials because you, you know, the real time asset won't get you to that level of detail. So we still need high res. But then we also then can decimate down to the different formats. It's not easy to take it up. It's easy to take it down. Great answer. <laughs> um, Ed, another question about materials or anyone else who maybe wants to step in. Um, another question for IOR. Will IOR in glass material, um, let me just read it again. Can I use IOR in glass material in GLTF? I've seen in Sketchfab, glass transparency has a few options. Is it possible for glass and GLTF uh, to be more realistic optically? Yes, absolutely. Actually, I'm glad you asked me that uh, question here. Let me see if I can uh, quickly do a little screen sharing. Um, we had a, uh, a press release on this back in July of this year, but we uh, released a couple of extensions. We released um, an IOR extension and a volume extension. And uh, we're looking right now, if you're seeing my screen share, you're, you're seeing uh, Babylon Sandbox showing our olive dish uh, sample model from uh, Wayfair. Thanks, Eric. Um, and you can see that the, the glass uh, actually distorts uh, the olives as it moves up and down there. Um, that's using uh, one of our, our new uh, IOR and the, the volume extension there. Uh, and then, of course, we also have the uh, the infamous uh, Stanford Dragon here um, with the checkered background. And it's um, this is uh, showing uh, IOR again, and it's also showing our thickness texture map. So this is a, a real time uh, non ray traced uh, image here. It's it's being rendered interactively on the web. And there's a thickness texture map that's telling this renderer that, for example, the the claw is thinner and the body is thicker. So you're seeing a deeper color here on the body than you see on the claw. And it's it's not perfect. There's some, you know, you could see a, a spike on the leg here sh shows with the thin color instead of the thick color because it's not casting rays all the way through. But it's a reasonable approximation of, of what uh, volumetric absorption would look like in that case. So yes, we, we, we have some cool uh, some, some cool extensions that were released earlier this year uh, that, that show glass uh, index of refraction and absorption. Awesome, yeah, thank, thank you for, for reminding everyone. It, um, you know, it looks, looks really amazing, it looks super powerful and uh, you know, we, we need to do as much as we can to kind of get the word out about the new capabilities uh, that are kind of in the most recent extensions. Um, <clears throat> switching gears a little bit away from materials, but I think we will, we will get back to it. Um, question, is it, personal, is it possible to place virtual items in a GPS-based AR environment and then save the coordinates on the place item into a sort of mini-map based on GPS, GPS location? Is there any examples of that? Um, I'm perhaps looking to maybe Tam or Peter to see if they have any experience with kind of geolocated assets in a VR or AR context. <laughs> So uh, this goes into the uh, whole world of geopose, right? Um, uh, your context is uh, different. So typically in the geospatial world where you have an asset, uh, whether that model is in GLTF or whatever space it is, 
you are typically associating it with some X, Y, Z location. And that's how it's displayed. That's how it's typically uh, uh, co-located co -located with other content. And AR and VR though becomes different. We have a different frame of reference where, for example, uh, you know, you are visualizing an asset that is geolocated in one space, but then within an AR or VR environment, uh, there is an alternate uh, frame of reference that needs also be referenced. Uh, so the uh, fact that you know you'd have this multiple frames of reference and how you reference from one to the other. Is, uh, is really now an open question and is an interesting one. And uh, OGC with this uh, proposal for GeoPose is really trying to address that, having like a common frame of reference that could be used across different, uh, different uh, systems. Um, so that's what we're seeing um, in our use case, in our application, we do have support for AR and VR uh, in the context of geospatial data. Uh, and one of the examples that I showed, you would see that, you know, uh, zooming out from space and coming in and then you are in a space and then uh, you're switching context into working into that uh, frame of reference. Still has a geographic attachment, uh, but you are really dealing with a different frame of reference. And this might want to add to the, uh, what I said now. <laughs> Awesome, thank you, Tam. Um, does anybody want to add anything else to that to um, any, other, any other panelists? That was pretty comprehensive. <laughs> okay, I'm um, moving on to the next question. Does, GLT, does GLTF support image sequences or movie clips as a texture uh, in any UV layout for mesh faces? I think I know the answer to that, but I'll let one of my panelists and experts uh, perhaps answer that question. Um, any volunteers? Okay, I'll go ahead and take that one. <laughs> uh, for today, no. Uh, you know, GLTF does not support image sequences, movie clips, or video textures, if you will. Um, this is one of these things that we are considering for well, one of our roadmap items. Um, what we would like to hear from you guys is what is the use case behind that? I mean, there's some very obvious ones, but maybe there's some abstract ones. And, you know, all, a lot of these kind of feature requests and income, we like to try to understand the problem that's been trying to solve behind it. And again, some are more obvious than others. Some of them are you know, really direct to the point, but um, we'd love to hear from, you know, what exactly you're trying to accomplish, what video textures would accomplish. Um, there's some other uh, options that may be available. Maybe we can guide you towards those. So I invite you to engage with us, uh, share your story, share your problem, and uh, we'd be happy to incorporate your feedback into our, our roadmap planning and future planning. Um, okay, this one has been answered live. Let's keep going through these. Um, I'm going to go to one of the more controversial ones. Controversial. Uh, GLTF and USD and USDZ. So uh, the first question was, how does one get from GLTF to USDZ? Um, Max, you maybe posted a, a, you know, one solution, but um, can you share some of your experiences? And then maybe I'd also like to ask uh, Daniel what, what they're doing at, at IKEA. Yeah, sure. So um, thanks. So there are some solutions uh, to convert one to the other. And um, of course, like if you have a really simple mesh with let's say base color texture and some standard geometry, you can translate it, it will look pretty much the same, okay. But when it gets a bit more complicated, like for example, let's say you have a GLTF that has one texture channel that is tiling and another texture channel that has um, like global UV coordinates for the whole object and you have AO, like ambient occlusion baked into like, uh, the texture. So you have like these two texture channels combined. Uh, that's something you can do with uh, GLTF. You can have two uh, UV channels, but you can, cannot do it with USDC. And so then suddenly this uh, conversion becomes a more complicated process if you want to account for that. So you could, for example, um, like create a new UV set for both and basically have an atlas for both, but then you use that tiling property that you had. And uh, these are these trade-offs that you will have to make sometimes. And that's um, also making it a bit more complicated and challenging to translate them always perfectly. Then uh, for example, animations, uh, this may be another topic where they can slightly differ. Uh, and um, so, so, so when it comes to the details, it's not always possible to map one 
uh, to the other without loss. Uh, but I think that's the case for most uh, of the formats out there. And um, so, so that's something that you, you just have to be aware of. So if you can uh, like reduce the uh, steps, uh, like the, the number of steps that um, convert one format to another, that's always better, right? Uh, Hope that helps. <laughs> Not sure, but yeah, maybe someone else has more insights or some additions. Well, I know Daniel, you mentioned that directly in your presentation that you are doing that. Uh, I, I think well, the audience would love to hear a little bit more detail about how you're accomplishing that. What are the pitfalls? Um, sure. Um, uh, I think Max pretty much covered it. I mean, I think that um, as far as I know, and I haven't got anyone deep tech right with me right now, but as far as I know, uh, we do GLTF and then convert to USDZ. So. Um, again, we have to just because of the demographic people using devices that are waiting for USDZ assets rather than GLBs or GLTS. So that, that's, there's that. But then there's also, um, I mean, to be really transparent, we've had quite a few complexities. It's not a, it's not a one shoe fits all. I'm sure Max, that's what Max has like, you know, brought up as well, because we found that we, we've had more complexities complexities and more problems getting stuff to work with usdz we found like some other problems coming out of that flow so when we first started launching the assets they were in gltf glb um, to begin with and then we had to kind of redevelop the pipeline to support usdz so it's not a straightforward answer but it's also it hasn't been a straightforward process either i'm afraid um, i mean max and the team there have been helping us to find this and working on this as well so I didn't really answer your question. Sorry, Brent. <laughs> no, I think it's it's complete. It's good to get your perspective and understand that you know there's there's kind of consistency between how how industry is solving this problem. Um, mm. I would have been it would have been more concerning if there was vastly different answers. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, again, it's just I think I think it's a case of that we have we have to do all the formats we can to hit as much of the target audience as possible, right? So, but we know that it's not been a smooth you know, straightforward flow just to go to GLB and just and go to USDZ. They've, they've come with different problems, I would say. Right now. Well, thank you, Daniel. Um, so there was a question that came in from Andrew. Uh, when will the Babylon exporter so we can utilize, utilize some of these new features and materials? For instance, I use 3DS Max and I'm pretty limited to about six basic material options. Um, I want to thank Thomas Lucini from Microsoft who posted a, a GitHub link in the chat uh, to follow tracking of that specific issue within the Babylon exporter. Uh, I'm also going to put my Autodesk hat on for one second and say, if you're interested in that, you should definitely join the 3ds Max beta program. There's interesting things happening with GLTS and PBR extensions, and that's a good place to follow that as well, uh, specifically for 3ds Max. Um, okay, jumping back to some open questions. Um, Ed, maybe tossing it to you. Is there a timeline for subsurface scattering and double-sided materials in GLTF? Well, double-sided materials were released with GLTF 2.0 in, uh, in 2017, and I'm sure they were available in GLTF 1.0 back even further than that. Um, subsurface scattering has been a, a topic of, of much debate. Uh, I don't have a specific timeline for when it becomes available, but there is a, a pull request out on GitHub uh, that I have a link to that I can post the link in the chat here. Um, so anyone is free to uh, look at the pull request and give feedback on it. Um, bear in mind that uh, the extension doesn't work in a vacuum. It, it depends on another extension called translucency and that works with the volume extension. So the, a number of these extensions all have parameters that are meant to sort of integrate and play together. So this this proposed extension is, is a tiny piece of a bigger picture, um, but it's still something that we can uh, we can collect public feedback on. Great, okay, I see you've linked that, awesome. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, a little bit with the tomatoes, but I maybe wanna give other panelists a chance to speak. Um, so there's a question that came in about uh, node-based shader graphs. Um, there was an initial question about what our GLTS plan is for supporting some st or, or even encouraging some form of standard standardization of node-based shader graphs. Um, there's an example here, a standards for implementation could help share content across use cases. For example, uh, uh, thin film interfaces. Um, maybe, maybe just backing up one second. Um, 
for some of the content creators on the line, I'm looking at Max and Peter, for example, um, where have you maybe learned or leveraged um, shader graphs versus textures to kind of augment your asset creation process? And how have you translated that or wish to translate that to kind of a real-time context? Maybe that helps us the stage a little bit um, for, for where some of these use cases are coming from. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, our experience with shader graphs was so far limited to the input uh, offline assets that we received. And then if you have, let's say, a, a max file with a complex shader graph, we would try to simplify it um, and then to basically use the physical material from 3ds Max that we can then use to export to GLDF. I suppose it's similar to what the Babylon exporter does. I'm not exactly sure how it does it, but uh, well, you have to start with a material that has like um, PBR ready uh, materials, right? And um, then if you have a shader graph that contains things like, let's say, I don't know, V-Ray dirt or whatever, or uh, fall off from V-Ray, you can translate them one to one. And so uh, this is always causing some headache, of course. So I can see the uh, the point that uh, if someone says, well, can't we just have the shader graph in real time and then the problem is solved? Uh, of course, it's not, not that easy, right? Uh, like shader graph is not equal to another shader graph usually. The, um, and you have to, to to at least use the same, same system. But um, yeah, so far we have really been uh, converting those things to like um, PBR materials with with uh, like textures and factors and but no no graphs no complicated artist created setups but just something that's ready to be re rendered by the engine and not receiving any material tweaks anymore so these have, have been two worlds so far for us at least awesome thank you max um peter anything to add to that or yeah, uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not really familiar with the node-based shader thing because in the consortium, as I mentioned, there was a, a 3D artist from the Italian partner. So uh, that's uh, that kind of uh, task or job, it uh, wasn't assigned to me, so. <laughs> Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I won't put you on this path. <laughs> um, I guess I'll add a little bit of color to that too, based on some, some other things that are going on. Um, you know, bubbling up one, high, one level higher, maybe a little bit back into the USD discussion. I think it would be, a, you know, a, an error on our part to try and augment or develop GLTF to be a competing 3D standard that is equivalent to something like USD and include full interoperability features like portable shader graphs. Uh, you know, reflecting on the GLTF mission about creating a super fast and efficient runtime format, you know, we have to keep that, that mission in mind and, and try not to compromise that with development choices we make. Now, if shader graphs or code defined shaders um, or procedural textures um, help reduce the transmission size and, you know, don't cost a lot on the interpretation side or the evaluation side in real time, then it's an awesome fit for GLTF. If it's purely for interoperability, a little bit less and it's harder to justify. Um, I can say that we are looking very closely at what other standards are doing, I'll name USD, and how they are potentially even looking at um, collaborations with other standards, and I'm gonna name out Material X, um, as good examples of how open standards can work together. And ultimately, I would say, we wanna make sure that GLTF is well positioned as a distillation target for, again, efficient, fast, runtime and real-time delivery um, downstream of the authoring process. We want to make sure GLTF is, is the best suited for that and that we have a good and lossless or almost lossless translation or distillation path from other authoring ecosystems and environments. So all that being said, I would look closely at what's happening in USD, what's happening in Material X, and I would definitely expect that we are also watching that and making sure that our development synchronizes well with what's going on on the authoring side. Um, I, I do think that like things like USD and Material X are gonna um, break down a lot of barriers for some of the challenges that you've mentioned, Henrik, mm -hmm. about interoperability between applications and engines, uh, and that we will definitely be a, a player in that ecosystem. Uh, I hope that answers the question or gives some color, but again, please uh, reach out if there's more questions or clarity required on that. Um, okay, du, 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 du. what else do we have? A couple of thanks, perfect. Um, 
maybe this is a good one for, for you, Leonard, or anybody else. Um, we have Jace who's question, uh, you know, questions about registering for vendor information. Um, you know, what's the process for creating a new custom extension in GLTF? I did start answering that question. Okay. <laughs> and so let me, I answered this first go around um, and that's why we have these follow-ons. And thank you for following up. Uh, the physical properties for class simulation, that is a current active work area within 3D formats and 3D commerce. Uh, we're trying to understand the, the actual requirements. Um, do you, is it need to be a static thing like you might find in accessories such as handbags or something else of a fairly non-moving nature? Or do you need to be able to have the, see the full flow that you might get with a silk or lace gown or something on that order? And they'll have very different um, properties as you've noted here. It's uh, something that's also very tactile. So we're trying to figure out if haptics can, need, should be involved in some manner, but that, that's a, a further, what's further downstream process. Uh, so the class simulation, the, the best way to, to, to get involved with that is the 3D Commerce has an advisory forum and 3D Formats has advisory panels. Um, it, these things are joinable. You can join as an individual or your organization. Uh, both working groups tap into those advisory forum panels uh, for guidance and for looking for additional use cases. So that becomes very important. Uh, for the more technical question of how do you register for new extensions, I'm going to toss that one back to Brent. You can send him an email at the, at the address he posted up earlier. Yeah, again, please, uh, if there's more detailed conversation happening, and we only have about three or four minutes left, um, please feel free to post all of your follow-up questions on our Slack channel or send me an email directly to the address posted above. You know, where we, uh, we're very engaged with our community and we want to maintain a very, very supportive uh, relationship with the community because we, we recognize that it's bilateral value. Um, I think we've covered all the open questions. I don't know if there's anything else that, you know, a topic or a question that any of the panelists wanted to, to close out on. Um, we do only have about three minutes left and I wanna respect everybody's time as well. Um, any last minute thoughts? <laughs> One thing uh, maybe I could say, um, the addition of uh, the KTX2 uh, or basis uh, compression for GLTF has been really a boon and has been a, a great uh, foresight also on the uh, work group and others to include it. As I've shown in the, some of the, my presentation, uh, that really has brought like real world impact uh, by reducing the uh, compressed texture that we have to shuttle different different assets. Uh, and in our use case, as I said earlier, we would uh, have to create this content, our users create it. So just wanted to really uh, commend the Kronos and the work group and including uh, that as a, a part of the uh, uh, GLTF standard. And we're really looking forward to using that more. Awesome. Thank you, Tan. Uh, and Lizzie is going to pop up the final slide. Perfect. Um, Daniel, did you want to mention one more thing? I, I saw you had your, your mic unmuted. Uh, we have about two minutes left, but I want to give one minute to thank all the presenters and panelists and, and attendees as well. So uh, if you have something. Let's do, that. Let's do that, Brent. No, it's all good. I just had a random thought, but we can, we can finish. Random thoughts are awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, <I'm>, well, <laughs> <laughs> right, it, was, it, was just, it was actually kind of like continuing on what Tam was just saying about the great work that's done here. I mean, people have talked about USDZ and GLTF and actually with the 3D Commerce and Kronos, you know, we're actually able to discuss and share problems and it's not so easy with the other formats, right? So we can't really, show, you know, how you have a problem, it's not so easy to get influence or change there. But while with this fantastic panel and this fantastic work that's done here, we can communicate and work together and i think that's a much better way of you know working with standards so thank you oh, we, we thank you uh, and i thank all the panelists for you know contributing their knowledge today i thank all the uh, attendees who joined today and the members who will continue to make gltf as good as it, as it is as great as it is on a weekly basis on a daily basis um again thanks to everyone and i look forward to seeing everyone at the next webinar uh, again tune into our webpage to find out when the next event is going to be and um and we'll see you all there. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add, Jeff? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you presenters for your time today and the excellent presentations. And thank you all for attending. 
We hope you enjoyed the web webinar. A recording of this presentation along with the slides will be available on the Kronos Group website in the coming days. A direct link will be sent to you up in the follow-up email. Also, as you leave, please take a moment to fill out the survey. Your feedback is important to us and it helps improve these pr presentations. And please let us know if there are any other Kronos-related topics you may be interested. And have a great day.